Okay, so now let's come back to our problem. Some of you had various uh, theories. Now, before discussing your models of what is happening, Now, let's first discuss what happens if I send it with this velocity. Now, although there I have written that with that speed, if you send it with that speed, if the cart reaches the top, its speed will be zero. The cart will, if you send the cart with that speed, it will never be able to reach the top. What it will actually do is that, okay, this is my cart. It will come here, it will go start to go up. As it goes up, its speed will be reduced. It will have a smaller, smaller speed. Well, there's a the gravitational acceleration pointing downward. When it, if it ever crosses this 90 degrees, the normal force exerted by the tracks will also be pointing downward. So the acceleration in the vertical direction will always be pointing downward. It is vertical speed will constantly decrease until there will come a point where the vertical speed is zero. It will still have some horizontal speed, but the vertical speed will be zero, but the circle is still going up. So it will not be able to follow the track. At this point, it will just leave the track. It will have some horizontal speed, horizontal velocity, so it will just follow such a trajectory. Uh, it, it will just fall down. Now we have two questions then. First of all, we still have this question, what is the speed, what should be its initial speed so that it reaches this top point? And the second question, if it doesn't have that speed, at what point will it leave the track? Those two questions we are looking for an answer. Okay, now, first, this question, what should be its initial speed? Yes. Now we first look at this problem. There's no sine theta over here. This problem. What should be the minimum speed so that it should reach here? Yes. Why? How? Yes. So you see, at this point, when the train is over there, what is the free body diagram? First, let's draw, the, well, there is the free body diagram. That, that is the free body diagram for an arbitrary theta. At the top, this is my mass. Let us just show it as a point. There is the weight pointing downward, and the tracks will exert some normal force. One of your friends had said in, in his first trial, in this case, I was just rotating it like this, he said that you stop exerting the force that caused it to rotate. Well, when I the force that I, I exert, my finger, is this normal force over here. When this normal force goes to zero, if that normal force goes to zero, well, there's no string anymore. Or in, that, in this example, in the roller coaster, there's no rails anymore for my mass because the rail is not exerting any force. So in that limit, the train is about to leave the rails. So that is the limit. The limit will be when if n is exactly equal to zero, that will be the limit that it will be able to go through the top. Now at the top, well, the only force is the central force. It is using uniform circular motion for a moment. For at that moment, it is just doing uniform circular motion. Only there's only the central acceleration. There is no tangential acceleration whatsoever. By the way, this is the free body diagram. You only have the mass plus the forces acting on this. This is not the free body diagram. 
This is not the free body diagram. Because here, there's all the other objects around. The idea of the free body diagram is that you isolate the relevant part and forget about the rest. So if you draw this diagram, if you are, when you are asked to draw a free body diagram, you will get zero. This is the correct free body diagram at this moment. Well, let's just choose some axis. The weight is minus mg in the z hat. The normal force, well, it has some magnitude in the minus z hat direction. It will be pointing downward. OK, first question, can this n be negative? Well, it can only be negative if uh, this is the train and the rails are like this, holding the train. In that case, it can be negative, but if it is just sliding on top without holding the train, it cannot be negative. N has to be always positive. In this example, N is positive, since we are allowing the car to get off the train, off the rail. Well, it had some speed over there. We have the normal force. We get, have the weight. The total force acting on it is minus n plus mg in the z minus z hat direction. Well, it is doing uniform circular motion with center in the minus z direction. So its acceleration is minus v squared over r in the z hat direction. And then you have the mass times minus v squared over r. This v is not the spe initial speed. This is the speed when it reaches the top. So from this expression, we know that, OK, we just equate the two. v squared, the speed at the top, should be equal to r n plus mg over m. Now you can use this thing, if you know v squared, you can use this relation to find the normal force exerted by the tracks on the on my cart. Or if you know n, you can use this to find the velo the speed at the top of the, uh, when the cart is at the top of the rails. Now we know that n is always positive. So if you add a, po add a positive number to any number, you get a number that is larger or equal to r times mg over m since n is positive. So we know that at the top, the speed of my cart, v squared, has to be larger than or equal to gr. So this is the speed that my cart should have if it goes over the top. Now, you can just think of what is happening over here. We have studied projectile motion. Over the top, if there were no rails, if I just take some mass, throw it with some horizontal speed, horizontal velocity, we know its trajectory. If the speed is very small, it will have such a trajectory. If the speed is very large, it will have such a trajectory. So it, cur it is curved even at the top. So at very close to here, it just looks like a circle. It's tangent to a circle at the top. So if your circle is, let's say, like this, and if you throw it with a very large speed, so what happens is it is trying to go out of the rail, but the rails will exert a force on my cart and will change its acceleration so that it will follow the rails. It is not just free projectile motion, but a projectile motion with some additional force. So it will not follow this path, it will follow the rail. But if the speed is very low, in any case, it is not trying to, fall to go over to the other side of the rail, so it will not be exerting any force on the rail. So the rail will not exert any force, so it will just fall down. If the, initial, if the speed at the top is smaller than 
given by that expression. This is the minimum value. So this value is in fact the value at which this projectile motion is tangent to my circle. Any questions on this one? Why this n, the minimum value is when n is equal to zero? Because when n is equal to zero, there is no force acting between my cart and the rail, so it is as if the rails is not there. That is the that is the threshold at which my cart would barely make through the top. If it is moving faster than that, then the rail will be always pushing the cart towards the interior region. If it is slower than that speed, then the cart would just will not be able to follow the uh, path of the rail. It will just fall down. Questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is this. Well, this is a hypothetical roller coaster where the rails are just flat, they are not holding onto the cart. But in real life, it is, well, let me try to draw it. If this is one of the rails, this is the other rails, this is the wheels, this is what I am imagining in this problem. But in real life, what happens is the rail has this closing part. So the wheels are not allowed to go away from the rail. So such a falling down will not happen in real life. Now in this case, by the way, the normal force can be negative. Because, well, let's say if you are, if the, when the uh, car is trying to fall down, the rail, if you are at the top with zero speed, what happens is the rails will be pushing you up. So that is, this n is negative. In that case, of course, we don't have this limit because well, the, there's no way that the cart will leave the rails. In that case, if you ask the question, so what is the minimum speed so that it will reach the top with such a rail system which holds it rather than letting it go? The previous answer is the correct one. This is the correct one. If you send it with 4GR in such a rail system, such that the wheels are always attached to the rails, they are not allowed to get loose, the train will go to the top with zero speed. Şimdi gerçek roller coasterlarda tekerlekler böyle bir e, rayların üzerine serbestçe bırakılmış değiller. Teker, raylar tekerleri tutuyor sağlam bir şekilde. Bunun içerisinde hareket edebiliyor. Ne uzaklaşabilir ne aşağı düşebilir. Dolayısıyla tepe taklak olduğunuzda sıfır hızda duruyor olsanız bile raylar sizin aşağı düşmenizi engelleyecektir. O durumda şu soruyu sorabiliriz. Raylardan ayrılma diye bir problemimiz zaten yok. Her halükarda tepedeyiz. O zaman tepeye çıkmak için minimum hızımız ne olması lazım? Ha, o zaman minimum hızınızın karesinin 4 gr olması lazım. Bu hızda, bu ilk hızda yola çıkarsanız tepeye ulaştığınızda sıfır hıza ulaşırsınız. Orada da durursunuz tepe taklak bir şekilde. Bineniniz var mı? Did anybody take a roller coaster? Uh, it is not something that I can do. Now, in this case, the difference of this case from the case we studied is that here we said that n is always negative. That is, the force that the rails exert on my train is always downward. Can be 
downward or zero if there is no contact. In this other case, when the rails are holding you upside down, then of course the tracks will exert you a force in the upward direction. If they are exerting a force in the upward direction, that would just mean that this N is negative. So we don't get this limit. It doesn't need a larger speed. Where it is four, we are, uh, sorry, sorry, th th we didn't yet complete the question yet, though. This V0, this V0, V squared is the speed at the top. Then the question is, what is the speed, the initial speed? So that when it reaches the top, its speed is, its speed squared is GR. Well, we can use the conservation of that 1 over 2 mv squared plus mgh. Initially, that number is 1 over 2 m v0 squared. At the top, it is 1 over 2 m v squared plus mg times 2r. Well, v, v squared is gr for the minimum speed. 1 over 2 gr plus 2 1 over 2 mgr plus 2 mgr. This is 5 over 2 mgr. And then you end up having the initial speed. The minimum initial speed that you should send the cart is 5gr. It's squared is 5gr. It's not smaller. It's 1gr larger than the previous case. And that additional gr just gives you the speed at the top. Now the other question, if the initial speed is less than this minimum speed, at what height does it leave the tracks? How can we proceed? Well, the hint is already over there, by the way. We have the free body diagrams. Always think in terms of the free body diagrams. We had already said that, well, how did we determine the minimum speed? What was the criteria for the minimum speed at the top? Which criteria did we impose to obtain that this number? GR, V squared is equal to GR. What was the criteria that we imposed that led us to this value, gr? What do we assume that we, when we say v squared is equal to gr? Normal is zero. That is the definition. Well, you see, when you, when you look at the question, this is the question. If the cart is moving with a speed less than the minimum speed, OK, that is the introduction of the question. At what point will it leave the track? How can you express this information in mathematical terms? What does this mean in terms of the parameters of my problem? That is something you should think of. We had already given an answer to that. And the answer was n should be 0. The normal force, when it leaves the track, at the moment that it is leaving the track, the normal force just becomes 0. That is the criteria that we should use to impose. We should use to obtain this minimum, this uh, point. Well, the normal force is zero. So the, there is only one force, the weight. But still, it is doing some circular motion, non-uniform, but still circular motion. So we know the central acceleration. So what is the central acceleration of my object? doing circular motion. So I'm just assuming that this is my roller coaster. Now at this point, it is about to leave the track, fall off. 
And it, at this point, let's say it has some speed v. It is a circle of radius r. So what is the central acceleration of an object doing circular motion? Wrong. What is the acceleration of an object doing circular motion? V squared over r. Acceleration. V squared over r times m. At that point, there should be a force pointed toward the center. Well, at least it should have a component pointing toward the center whose size, whose magnitude should be equal to this one so that it does circular motion. Well, I have a single force, the weight. I can always decompose the weight to its central, central component and the tangential component. This is the central component and this is the tangential component of the weight. Well, the central component, if this angle is theta, okay, so this angle over is theta. So this angle over here is pi minus theta, or this angle here is also theta. So the magnitude of the central component is sin theta, mg sine theta. So if it leaves the track at this point, at that point, the speed and the angle theta should be related by v squared is equal to gr sine theta. Well, here there are, I have two unknowns. I don't know v, I don't know theta. Now, I'm interested in finding the angle theta. So I should be able, I should write v squared in terms of quantities that I know. Well, the speed I can calculate, speed at any height I can calculate using the conservation of one over two mv squared plus mgh. At this point, it was one over two mv zero squared. This is the initial value of that combination. When I reach here, it is one over two m v squared plus m g. Well, this height is r. I have this additional height, which is r sine theta. I had two unknowns, v squared and sine theta. Now I have two equations v squared and sine theta. I, I have two equations in terms of v squared and sine theta. What we can do is we just substitute this v squared into that expression over there, one over two m v zero squared. This is equal to one over two m g r sine theta plus mgr1 plus sine theta. And then you can just solve for sine theta. And it turns out that sine theta is equal to this number over there. OK, as usual, you should always, always think that does this equation make sense? First thing, does it have the correct units? Sine theta doesn't have any units. What's the unit of v squared? v squared is meter squared over per second squared minus, what is the unit of g? Meters per second squared. What is the unit of r? Meters. So these two terms, v squared and 2gr, have the same units at least. We, you cannot add or subtract quantities with different units. So that is good news. Well, gr is just the meter squared per second squared. It has the same unit. So this right-hand side doesn't have any units. The left-hand side doesn't have any unit also. 
Okay, so we know that sine of any angle take values between minus one and one. So what if V0 is much larger than, V0 is very large? Doesn't it go above one? So what does it mean? Well, what is the value of sine that makes sine theta equal to one? Five gr. When v zero squared is five gr, sine theta is one. Well, we had already found that the minimum value for it to go around is five gr. So here we, from the beginning, we are assuming that v zero squared is smaller than five gr. So sine theta is always less than or equal to one. Or if you had found this relation, if V0 squared is larger than 5G, you could have said that if V0 squared is larger than 3GR, sine this equation doesn't have any solution. So it just means that at no angle my card falls down. So this gives me the angle at which, the solution of this angle equation gives me the angle at which my card leaves the track. If this equation doesn't have any solution, that means my card is never leaving the track. This three sine theta, okay, this is the equation we have. mv squared is gr sine theta. So here I have a one over two mgr sine theta. Here I have another mgr sine theta. One over two plus one is three over two. Other questions? Any questions about this? Quiz? Well, if you want a quiz, I can prepare one. Yeah. Now, this angle gives me at which point it will leave the track. Once it leaves the track, it is making projectile motion with some initial angle. Well, at that, it will be, before it leaves the track, it is moving tangent to the track. So the, you can find the tangent to the circle, which will give you the direction of the speed at the moment it leaves. Oh, so you are really getting ready for the quiz, no? Well, that is what I thought. That's what I why I didn't make any quizzes this week. Now, I'm not planning to cover any new subjects before the exam, but if you have any other questions that you would like us to discuss, we can discuss it now. We still have like 10, 15 minutes. The equivalence principle. So, stated in simple terms, it just means that if you think of mass, mass appeared in two different places for us. It appeared in Newton's laws, it just appeared as a measure of the inertia of the system, its resistance to any change in its motion. We know that even if we apply the same force on two different objects, they do not need to react at the same uh, rate. Their acceleration can be completely different depending on the mass they have. So that is what we call the inertial mass. And then the mass also appeared as the source of gravity. If you have any massive object, it creates a gravitational field which will attract other masses. And in principle, these two masses can be completely different. There is no fundamental principle that we know that tells us that these two masses should be the same. But they just turn out to be the same. We are trying to measure if there is any difference in between the two, and until now, we, we always failed. 
And this equality is what causes the fact that every mass close to the surface of the Earth falls at the same rate. If I just empty the air, if I leave this ball, if I leave this thing at from the same height, they will fall onto the ground at the same time. Because since the gravitational mass and the inertial mass are the same, in the acceleration, they just cancel each other. So this has a larger mass than this one. So this will feel a larger gravitational force than this one. But this also has a larger inertia, resistance to change in its motion, than this one. So these two effects just cancel each other, and both of them accelerate at the same rate. Now, this seems to be a quite a simple principle, simple equivalence, the equality of th these two things. But it just leads to important consequences. Now, the, uh, we had seen the principle of relativity for velocity. We had discussed relative velocity, what we mean by velocity. When we measure the velocity, it depends on who is making the measurement. If I am measuring your velocity, I will, see, I will measure it to be zero. If I start moving at constant speed there, and if I measure his velocity according to this reference frame, then I will observe a, a finite velocity for him. And this relativity, the principle of relativity tells that the physical laws should be independent of which inertial reference frame you write them in. What do we mean by physical laws? F is equal to ma is a physical law. So if I write it, if I apply this law in this reference frame with the force and the acceleration I measure, it will be true. If I apply this law in the reference frame which moves at some constant speed, another inertial reference frame, this law will still be true. But of course, the acceleration, the velocity will be, uh, the velocity that I measure will depend on who is making the measurement, but nevertheless, acceleration is not. Because if you consider two inertial reference frames, if v, pro v is the speed at one inertial reference frame, and V prime is the speed in another re inertial reference frame, then these two are related by this equation where this capital V is the speed, relative speed of the inertial reference frames. This one, the relative motion. This is the relativity of speeds. But inertial reference frames can move at most at constant speed relative to each other. So this equation tells me that the acceleration are the same in both inertial reference frames. Well, Einstein didn't like this idea that acceleration was absolute. Velocity is relative to which reference frame you are measuring it. But acceleration is the same in all reference frames. Einstein didn't want to claim that acceleration is also relative to any inertial reference frame. Well, this absoluteness of this uh, uh, acceleration just means that if you are in a closed room, and then you can tell whether some your reference frame is accelerating or not without looking outside. You can determine absolutely whether you are in an accelerating reference frame or not. But this uh, equivalence principle saved Einstein because this principle tells me that, uh, for example, here we know that we have a weight. So it is pulling us down. So we believe that Earth is still outside. When we go out, we will see Earth there. But if the whole classroom was accelerating in empty space with an acceleration I which is equal in magnitude to the gravitational acceleration, Nothing we feel will be different change. So we could have go outside and find empty space outside because of the equality of the inertial mass and the gravitational mass. Then Einstein said that even acceleration, we can, if you are in a closed room, you cannot determine whether you are accelerating or not. It can be that you are accelerating, or it can be that there is some gravitational field at where you are. Those two things should create the same effects. 
that's kind of the equivalence principle. Well, that is a consequence of the equivalence principle. So those two observers, the observer that is sitting in the class on the surface of the Earth, and the observer that is in empty space in which the class is accelerating, whatever measurement they make, they should see exactly the same result. Hmm? As a consequence, the light should bend in gravitational field. Because if you have an accelerating reference frame, in that reference frame, the light rays bend. Not because the light ray is bending, but the, you are moving at an even faster speed. Right? Let's just imagine it like this. This is your closed box class. There is a, a very small beam of light. You just send a very small beam of, beam of light with the speed of light in that direction at some moment. Now, in the next moment, let, let's say that it is for an outside observer. It is a time at which the elevator has zero speed, everything is at rest, but the elevator has some finite acceleration. In the next unit of time, <coughs> the elevator would move up by one unit. Let's say this is one unit, whatever the unit you are using, in, the in one unit of time. Well, this mass will still, con it was here, now it has moved here. In the second, second, second unit of time, it will, it will move up by three more units. So that from the beginning, it has moved four units. Well, why four units? Because the displacement is equal to one over two acceleration times t squared. If in one unit time, if it uses moves one unit, in two units times, it will move four units. But this bunch, very small packet of light is still going parallel. Okay, so the light just goes straight in my reference frame for an outside observer. Now let's see, I'm sitting here. What will I see? Well, this well, this midpoint, let's say, midpoint is now here at this reference frame. So the light ray is now one unit below the midpoint. In this case, it is over here. So this, well, it has moved a bit horizontally. This light ray is now four units down the midpoint. So for this observer, the light ray just moves in one, Initially it was here, in one unit time it moved here, in the second unit time it is here. So it is following a parabola for the observer accelerating with the elevator. But this equivalence principle tells me that this accelerated reference frame is identical to a reference frame in which this elevator is sitting on a planet, in which the gravitational acceleration on the surface is equal to the acceleration of the elevator. They should be identical. This is the equivalence principle, well, not this one. This is what equivalence principle tells me. The observer inside shouldn't be able to distinguish an el accelerating elevator from an elevator that sits on a planet. If he cannot distinguish the two, the light, light rays should bend also in the gravitational field of a planet. So starting from just equality of two masses, we can reach the conclusion that the gravity should bend light rays, even if the light doesn't have any mass. Now your friend has figured that out. He can explain you in more, in better words. Okay. 
other questions? Okay. Read the question. Now well, you have five minutes at most for the solution. Read it aloud. Well, then we don't have enough time to solve it anyway. So we can discuss it after the, uh, after the class for those interested. We don't. We are trying to understand why they turn out to be equal. This is one of the puzzles we are trying to solve. Why they are equal? Are they equal? We don't know. We are. Our most precise measurements up to date have shown no difference between these two masses. So, experiment tells us that they seem to be equal, but then why they are they equal? We also don't see any reason why. But if they are not equal, then you can just throw away Einstein's theory of gravity. For the time being, it's an observation, experimental observation that they are equal up to a very high precision. That is what we observe. We didn't observe any deviation between the two masses within our experimental limits. Experimental measurements always have some error bars. Within the error bars, they are equal. But I don't know, in 10 years, maybe if we can make more precise measurements, will they be equal? Well, we don't know. They seem to be equal, they are equal. I mean, uh, in, in, in nature, it is very barely that two things, two things are either equal to each other or they are completely different from each other. You never get two things that are almost equal without some more fundamental principle. They seem to be equal, but we don't. We still don't understand why. So uh, we will see each other on Saturday.